Epson makes your printer, my scanner, and back in the early 2000s, digital cameras. Like this one, the Epson Photo PC 650, which this video is definitely not about, don't worry. It's a neat little digicam, but nothing jaw dropping. And that's why most people forget that Epson even made cameras. That and the fact that they stopped making cameras as early as 2004. They made about 15 different cameras in total and all but one of them were like this. Point and shoots aimed at a more casual market. And then they made this. This is the Epson RD1 released in 2004 as one of Epson's last cameras, and it is nothing like their other cameras. Actually, it's like no other digital camera at all. Let me explain how. Let's start with what this camera even is. This is a digital camera as much as it doesn't look like it, and I'll explain how all this up here works in just a minute. It's actually the first digital rangefinder camera to ever be made. A rangefinder camera uses a special type of focusing system that allows the photographer to look through this optical finder that is not looking through the lens of the camera, but still allows focusing. This is the system that is most famously used in Leica's even today, but Epson actually beat Leica to the punch with the first digital rangefinder. To this day, Epson is still one of only three companies to have ever produced a digital rangefinder, making these still really uncommon today. You'll notice on the back that the camera has no LCD screen. Actually, it does, it's just hidden. And I'd leave it hidden away anytime that I'm shooting. This isn't just because it makes it some fun analog experience. It's because this camera has no live view. The only thing the screen is used for is a handful of functions that can't be changed with just the physical buttons themselves. But many things can be changed with these physical buttons and they're genius. Over here is a simple switch that can be used to switch the frame lines in the viewfinder depending on the lens that you're using. This on the side is a dual purpose dial that can pop up or lower down and then changes different settings depending on that. There's a multi-adjustment dial here that allows you to select exposure compensation or shutter speed and then select your ISO by pulling up and twisting, which is just an excellent throwback to the manual film cameras. Here's a quick switch and button combo to change white balance or a variety of settings. And whenever you change one of those settings, this happens. Real quick before we get to these, I'd like to let you know where I found this camera because it's pretty tough to find, especially for a good price. I bought it from the sponsor of today's video, which is Bai. Bai is a website for shopping local listings that are only available in Japan, and they offer access to a wide variety of these peer-to-peer -peer Japanese listing websites. When you buy an item on Bai, it is shipped domestically in Japan to Bai's warehouse. From there, they can inspect the item, and then if all is good, ship it to wherever you are in the world. It's a fantastic way to get rare camera gear because you're not competing against everybody else in your country on whatever popular auction website you have. My tips for finding really good deals there are to use the automatic search alerts, pay attention, close attention to the yen conversion rates, and then just remember in the back of your head that you're gonna have to pay for shipping twice. Check out my link below to save more money. Thanks to Bai for sponsoring this video and for making a cool website that got me this camera. Instead of an LCD display on this camera, the camera uses physical gauges to inform you of a variety of settings. I've only ever seen this on two other cameras, a film 35 millimeter camera from Nikon, the 35Ti, and oddly enough, a Samsung point and shoot called the NV9 but it's definitely uncommon. You can see how many shots you have left on your SD card. You can see the image quality setting if you're shooting RAW or just JPEG. It lets you know how much battery life you have left and it lets you know the white balance setting. But if you thought those features were the most analog thing on this camera, you'd be wrong. I don't know if you caught this earlier, but you might've been wondering what a film winder is doing on a digital camera. On an older manual film camera, this would be used to wind the mechanical shutter and then advance the film. Newer film cameras and digital cameras don't need this because for those that have the physical shutter, it's electronically controlled. Some camera designs have incorporated something like this, but it's just for the looks. But on this camera, it's actually not just for show. To shoot this camera, you must pull this back for each shot because it is actually physically winding the shutter. This I'm sure will split the audience into who would actually care for this feature, 
but I love it. And when I shoot film, I'm most drawn to those older manual cameras that require manually winding the shutter. There's something about that extra physicality and manual nature of a camera that is gripping. And at this point in the video, I'll surprise you with the fact that this is only a six megapixel sensor. You wouldn't have guessed that from the incredible image quality. Not that you can tell on YouTube anyway, but that's besides the point. Now it's not perfect. The sensor isn't up to snuff with modern sensors. Of course, this is 20 years old. So it has the common shortcomings of an older CCD sensor from the early 2000s. The biggest thing you have to work around is the mushiness with higher ISO settings. But if you treat it with respect, you will get some fantastic images out of it. It's actually the same sensor found in a few other six megapixel DSLRs from the same era. So if you're just after the sensor, the more economical way to do that would be to go through one of those. Oh yeah, because did I mention this camera has held on to value like crazy. The prices seem outrageous at first for a six megapixel camera from 20 years ago. But if you think a little bit more about it, it's actually very predictable. The price makes sense. Later models of this camera never came out. Well, not really. There's a couple of revisions. This one's the Epson RD1S for instance, but they're just minor improvements on the camera, not like a new sensor or anything. So there's nothing newer to drive the price of these older models down. And then like I mentioned before, digital rangefinders are still rather uncommon today. So your options right now are either Leica or the newcomer Pixie, and both of those cost thousands of dollars. And then I've never owned a Leica. Actually, there's one up there on that shelf, but we don't talk about that yet. But I do own the Pixie camera, and this camera is nothing like it. This is a truly unique digital camera experience with the manual mechanical shutter winding, the gauges on the front of the camera, the no LCD, no live view. And then the results are fantastic despite the limitations of the older sensor. And all of that makes this honestly the perfect digital rangefinder I can think of. If they just made a modern version of it, that'd be awesome. So, but is it worth the price? Well, I only paid half of what it's going for nowadays, so that's a huge relief. But even then, it was a hard pill to swallow. But after using it now for a little bit, I have zero buyer's remorse. I'm actually planning on selling off some other cameras that this camera will now be replacing. More to come on the camera as I get more photos with it, but it's awesome. I also mentioned the Pixie in this video, which I do own, and I made a video, I made two videos on that camera, so I'll put those here for you to learn a little bit more about that for a modern take on a digital rangefinder camera. I'll see you over there in those videos, and until next time, as always, happy snapping.